Wow, so many reasons. Uh, Women's <laughs> rights, civil rights, rights I'm for people of color. Not only a woman, rights. but I'm also a minority. And it's it's scary Women to be in this predicament when LGBTQ you don't know what's going to We've come a long way. Even and to have the threat of bullying, knocking down and everything that everyone has been fighting like against that. being shut down. I want to do it back. The increase of violence here is due to this. And two of us are scared. It's not only time to do My name is Marisol Artiaga and I'm a fashion designer and I live in New York City. I saw that the march was happening so I emailed them and they contacted me and asked me if I could use my skills as a fashion designer to help them make sashes for the women's march. So I was thrilled to be able to have a project like that. Um, I think the sashes are really iconic for the women's suffragette movement dating back from the late 19th century at that time when the women were fighting for their rights. When you see the pictures, you most often see the women lined up wearing the sashes. I think it's really important to have them now because it speaks of a legacy and a heritage and of an ongoing struggle that women have had, and I think it's really powerful. We really wanted to have them made in New York. We felt that was really important. My name is Demarius Purnell. I'm the founder and CEO of JBC Luxury Leather Goods. I want to show my support any way I know how. The best way I could. Any way I could. This is Mr. Lee. This man ran this establishment for uh, many years. He's on the sashes right now. So they're going to receive uh, 475 sashes. I was raised by a family of strong women. So anything that empowers women, I'm for it. We reached out to a number of people and we found um, Mood Fabric donated all of the fabric for us, which is wonderful. Oh, my name is Jack Soma. I am the founder of Mood Designer Fabric in uh, New York. I'm born in Syria, uh, grew up in Sweden, and uh, I'm here 41 years. A lot of designers, they discover Mood because we have a lot of variety, but when the Project Runway came in, uh, it became more international. My employees, they're hand-picked. They're all very uh, artistic. They know fabrics, they know designs. Nobody dis discriminates here, everybody's equal. We take them in, so they're beautiful. My name is Sharon Ferreira Nunez. I am general manager here at Mood Fabrics. Lived in New York City my entire life. My name is Brenda Polanco. I'm the executive assistant and the closeout buyer for Mood Fabrics. I'm 33 years old and I'm from Harlem, New York. The diversity in mood, I would say, is so similar to of the diversity in fashion. We live in New York, so we're not used to what goes on in the rest of the country. We assume everybody in the rest of the country is like New York, where it's like a big melting pot. We socially accept everybody. We don't look at color, we look at people. Different ages, different sizes, different sexual orientation. I, I, I think about half of the staff here is gay or lesbian, as, as in fashion. I'm Rain Dove, and I am a model and activist. I do what we consider to be both men's and women's wear. I'm an activist for all things that are our universal truths. Food, shelter, water, basic physical safety for all things on the planet. I am what I like to call a gender capitalist, and that means that like, I take advantage of whatever I feel is the most um, profitable gender to be perceived as, as society deems that gender to look. So I went with the fact that people thought I was a guy and I thought, man, looking like a white guy in America, isn't that supposed to be the best thing that you could possibly be? I mean, I want, I want to have all the privilege. I don't want to have any disadvantage. I don't think anybody should. I think we should be able to have the best of everything. It's not fair that our whole life it is divided in half the minute that we're born. What we should have, what we have the right to have, the, how polite people should be to us, how much money we should be making, how much trust we should have, you know. I just don't have time to be disadvantaged. I'm definitely going to wear this at the march. Um, you know, magenta or pink, any form of pink, the, um, it has 
only recently actually been affiliated with being a female color. So my goal is to wear a color that really represents the shift and change in thought and also represents the women's party in a way, but it's, it's, it's cut to be a men's style blazer. I just want to be myself. I think it's important when people go into the march that they're marching for a unified voice and vision, but that they're marching as themselves. And they're not wearing anything to impress anyone. They're not doing anything for anything um, other than themselves. And, and what it means for them to be free. It's just nice to forget for a little bit that we're all different and what our differences are and that we have different beliefs here. Nobody sees that. We just all like the same thing. That's fabric, fashion, wearing it, putting it together. You know, it's, it's nice. You forget. For the eight hours that I'm here, I forget about the reality that's outside. I'm Solange Franklin Reed. I'm a fashion editor and stylist in New York City. I'm originally from Des Moines, Iowa, and I'm 31 years old. Fashion and protest is something that is an easy tool to use um, because it's accessible and it's something that we all do. We all put on clothes. Um, and so choosing to speak with your body, I think, is powerful. Now I'm thinking about the march and how people are dressing and how, you know, some people might be in body paint, some people might um, wear sashes. You know, some people are wearing bright colors, some people are wearing hats, some people are are literally making themselves a sign. I think that it just shows to the different types of voices that we have and like what we see this moment meaning. And for me, I just knew that I wanted to wear something very stripped down. It's not as much about an armor for me, which is something that I think I think about a lot in New York and just kind of braving the outside world and how I want to protect myself, but also how I want to show myself to the world. And there's something about, to me, showing up to the march and just a stripped down fashion of like, like I'm enough. And so I'm wearing a black turtleneck. It's like the Black Panthers, like natural hair and berets and their leather. We can separate ourselves and think that what I wear doesn't matter. And in many ways what you wear doesn't matter. But in many ways, obviously we determine so many things by how somebody looks. You know, are you presentable enough to be, um, in the corporate ladder, are you presentable enough to be not shot down within 15 seconds as you know a child playing on a playground? And so that is about changing people's perceptions. I think for the first time I realized that just because we're in New York, that doesn't mean those tensions don't apply here. I realized that they do. And we're so blinded by what we're used to that when you realize that there is racism here as well, it's kind of eye-opening. And the day after the election, that's how the city felt. It was like walking on eggshells, everybody was tensed. Nobody knew what to say to the other person. People were crying. It, I don't think I've seen the city like that since 9-11. My name is Amaniel Katatba. I'm the founder of MuslimGirl.com. I'm 24 years old and I live in Brooklyn, New York. I was nine years old when 9-11 happened. So of course it was extremely difficult growing up uh, under the height of modern Islamophobia. The headscarf is definitely a personal choice. And I think that that really is the entire spirit of it. It's not a something that should be or can be imposed upon a woman. It has to be something that comes from her. It comes from her internally, from her heart. Um, and it really is an expression of her relationship with her spirituality, with God, the way that she chooses to practice her religion. Uh, and I think that that's the most powerful thing about it. And if anything, I think that that's how the headscarf has kind of become the center of this tug and pull over women's autonomy, right? Whether it is entities that want to force women to put a scarf on their heads or entities that want to force women to take the scarf off their heads, like in France and other governments, both are still expressions of this control over Muslim women's bodies, over their attire and the way that they choose to express themselves in the public space. And for me, that's what makes the headscarf and my decision to wear it that much more empowering is that it is my choice. I think right now more than ever we really need our allies to stand up for us especially our fellow women. I think that's where our liberation lies uh, and it really does come down to a life or death situation for a lot of us you know especially for Muslim women that wear a headscarf in public. We need that support um, but really more than ever we have to recognize that there are women right now that are exhausted and that are scared and it's our duty to really just just stand hand in hand with each other right now, stand up for one another and recognize that we are our sister's keeper. I feel like fashion is 
probably the most important way we can express ourselves because it's fashion at the end of the day is wearable art um so whatever you're feeling you can actually convey it with your clothing so of course fashion is important in every realm of expression including politics you know um with the women's march specifically and fashion it would have been nice if we could all just wear this sash to the, to the march and nothing else i think that would make a big splash my name is roxanne jackson i live in brooklyn new york and i am an artist and also a ceramics professor donald trump called hillary clinton a nasty woman in the third debate and what we want to do is kind of bring that term back and make it not one that's derogatory towards women, but make it positive so that we can stand in solidarity and say, yeah, we are nasty women. Now what? What do you want to do about it? It's not just about Trump saying that to Hillary Clinton. It's really about that women everywhere can relate to what it's like to be insulted in that way by a man. So this is a way to really try to kind of diffuse any power that men who are sexist in particular, might think that they have over us. I'm Lauren Weiss, I'm 27. I'm a social media marketing associate at a nonprofit. And I've always been a person who's been very vocal online, but this is my first kind of foray into actual activism because collectivism isn't activism, unfortunately. It can't be that easy. Um, you do actually have to get out there and do something. The minute I heard it, it just made me think of all the times I've been called something like it when I've been vocal about politics or when I've stood up for myself in the workplace environment or in school. I was kind of a you know, outspoken teenager, I would say, and I got you know, called a bitch on a regular basis. And it just brought all of that home and it, watching one of the most, if not the most qualified candidates we've ever had run for office and just go through the same shit that I go through <laughs> as just an average woman. It just kind of, it was probably one of the most enraging moments in the election for me. And it was one of the moments that made me say, you know, I have to be active. Like no matter what happens, I have to get out there. I have to be a nasty woman. I have to get involved. I have to be loud not be afraid of being called something like that. Um, because if you don't defend yourself, if you don't fight for your rights, who's going to? My name is Sherry Helstein. I'm 69 and I'm retired. My t-shirt was actually given to me by a friend who uh, made it for me. And some people think it's inappropriate, but I think it's perfect for this March that's coming up. And I will be wearing this one. I believe this shows a pussycat that he's grabbing, and I love animals. I don't know how he feels about animals. But it expresses, in a funny way, something that isn't funny at all. It's sexual abuse. We shall not, we shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved, just like a tree that's standing by the My name is Ariely Laya. I'm a fashion curator, uh, originally from California and moved to New York about eight years ago, and I'm 30. It's interesting if you look at different political statements or clothing that is connected to politics, uh, oftentimes it used to be the t-shirt and you have to really be up close to actually read what it meant. The hats was this perfect symbol where everybody keeps on talking about the sea of pink hats. This great visual marker of all these women coming together, making this huge political statement. But I think even the color of it was quite important in what does the color pink uh, symbolize? Really kind of reclaiming, is it a weak color? It's absolutely not. It's a very strong, very powerful color, uh, the fact that you could be a feminist and you could love pink. I think the women, when they originally thought of the project, I don't think they had an idea of how big it could be. And I was really impressed of how it picked up. It was something that is a very simple pattern that people could create, even just seeing the generations of women coming together. This idea of people who didn't knit were coming together with people who were expert knitters or crocheters. They have these safe zones where it's in the comfort of somebody's home or maybe in like a knitting store that you have these groups of women coming together with, what do we do next and if you go on to the pussy hat project website um, to me what was incredible is you look at this Google map and you have all these dots of pink around the world and so it kind of carries on and has this life afterwards that it wasn't just at the March but now it's around the world that women are wearing this and it's really become a symbol of the March but also after a symbol of the movement 
I think that fashion is definitely a huge political statement though. We are animals and our clothing is not a natural thing. It is actually our fur, our feathers, our scales. It is something artificial that we add to our body to tell the world what we are and who we are. And we have always been told what we can wear and what we should wear based on the body that we have. And the most political thing we can do is wear the things we were never allowed to, especially the things that upset people. Because if you do it enough, people will become bored. And when people are bored, your job is done and you are free. This isn't a feminist march. It's a march for equality. I know it's called a women's march, but this is a march that says, we don't want to be better than anyone. We just don't want to be less than. And I think it's really important that women um, understand that they have an immense amount of responsibility on their shoulders to call for equal treatment, not better than treatment, equal treatment. And for men to say, okay, I'm gonna step down or I'm gonna step with you, I'm gonna walk with you and I'm gonna be equal with you. This isn't choosing teams and it isn't choosing sides. This isn't a football game. We're the human species <laughs> and um, we're really just a bunch of like blobs of flesh walking around and the whole entire division of us based on our genitalia and chromosomes is absolutely ridiculous, <laughs> you know? So I hope, I hope that people don't see this as like, there goes the woman's team walking down the street. I hope they see it as like, here goes a portion of the human species that has a particularly formed type of flesh and they're kind of treated differently because of that different formation of that flesh. And we recognize that and we're gonna work on making it better for them in the future.